Step Brothers Unite is a statement that will either make you giddy or dizzy. These Will Ferrell man-child movies have been a strange addiction of mine for a long time now. Be it semi-pro, the land of the lost, daddy's home, or the campaign. I hate to watch these movies because I suppose on a basic level, I just want to understand them. How can one man be in so many movies, be one of the most prolific and highest paid comedic talents in Hollywood, and still do the exact same shtick? in all of them. I'm a brilliant genius. I'm not conceited, it's just the way I am. And I have such an amazing brain, and it's just a fact. These movies are like skins in a video game, despite all having a different flair or gimmick. Fundamentally, it's always going to be the same base model. And I suppose, in a way, that's kind of been the appeal. With the caveat that every now and again, there'd be one just funny enough to make you forget about the bad. Yet, over time, as the concepts ran thin and the repetition started to settle, the universe perfectly aligned with the worst possible set of circumstances to guarantee the creation of Holmes and Watson. I suppose the list of man-child roles for Will Ferrell to play was so spent that by 2017, the only reasonable choice was to delve into the public domain for inspiration. Sherlock Holmes is obviously highly recognisable, importantly including wide Hollywood appeal thanks to the Guy Ritchie movies in the Benedict Cucumber Batch BBC miniseries. In the boardroom, this film must have looked like a slam dunk. You have the guy who helped write Madagascar 2 and classic Mike Judge comedies. You have Step Brothers Unite. You have the guy who did the Boom Block soundtrack. You have 42 million dollars. You somehow have Rafe Fiennes and Kelly MacDonald. You also snagged Rob Brydon and Steve Coogan. So, best to avoid laughing. If you want to do that, I can re recommend watching a film that John and I did called Holmes and Watson. You should be pretty safe with that. Steve Coogan isn't even in the credits and they put him on the poster. After the disastrously successful Get Hard proved that director Eaton Cohen, no, it's not that one, was capable of praying to Satan and summoning 111 million plus smackers of unholy capital, the world was Eaton's oyster. Now was his time to take his impressive background in comedy and prove himself on the cinematic stage. Tell the story he'd always wanted to tell. You see, it's a type of a self photograph. I can take it and I will be in it also. Purse your lips together like a duck. From the word go, this entire project was an awful, awful idea. Floating around in development hell from as early as 2008, originally intended for Sasha Baron Cohen to lead as Sherlock and Will Ferrell to support as Watson, with Judd Apatow producing, as an obvious response to the success of Talladega Nights. That pitch never came to be. Instead, rather suddenly in 2016, when a scheduling slot opened and Sony realised they had a few extra million lying around that they needed to launder, yeah, they seized the moment, alright. Based on the sheer amount of behind the scenes featurettes and advertising available for this movie, it seems reasonable to assume that they didn't quite expect this to be as bad as it turned out. Will is the best Holmes because he can get away with anything and still not seem like a bad guy. His superpower is that he can be these guys who might be a jerk coming from any other actor, but he makes them lovable because he's Will. Or they did know and knowingly decided to torture the entire cast by giving them the impossible job of explaining the basic goals and intent of the story. Yeah, we decided that the most famous characters in the English literature needed an American revamp <laughs> by Will and I, but we still kept it English. We still kept it English. Mm. Um, the context and intent is everything to me when talking about a movie, so it is maddening listening to the people involved in the project flounder and attempt to distract from how much of a disaster it turned out to be. You know, everyone in the world is a fan of Will and John together. That's sort of a gimme. Um, and then we could get to see them together physically, I feel like no matter what kind of comedy you like, there is something for you in this movie. Each person appears to have a completely different idea for what the film is going for. Sometimes it's awkwardly relying on their stepbrothers and Talladega Knight's reputation. Well, I saw the movie and it is very funny. Everyone in the world is a fan of Will and John together. Well, if you saw stepbrothers... So it reminds you of something you've already seen, you've already loved, and that, that's, that's really lovely. To pass it off as the kappa to the great man-child trilogy, but at the same time also communicating this idea that at its heart it's a tried and true Sherlock Holmes story that fans of the source material would enjoy. It's not a spoof on previous Holmes and Watson movies. It's got its own brand of humor. This is the best part, no? Creamy buttocks. We're playing the, the genre and the time period, you know, you know, absolutely real. Platypus face, chins up. Mm. Mm. Hey! You really feel like it's, you're in a 
like a serious genre movie, which is always what we wanted to achieve. I could use a bit of cocaine. Uh, close enough to the target for real, you know, Holmes and Watson fans to be satisfied and appreciative. It's a period, correct? <laughs> Victorian comedy and then... <laughs> At one point, they even half attempted to pass it off as a Christmas movie. Is this a Christmas movie? Oh, sure. Merry it's Old England and all. Right. Yeah. 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 On Tiny Christmas Tim. Day. In fact, the single best performance related to this project is the one Will Ferrell gives in the featurette where he has to try and pretend that there's some kind of genius wit behind the movie. We get to comment on on the current world. Just various aspects that, that when you read the books, you think... It's bad as like an apple, eh? Mm -hmm. Mm. Oh, that'd be funny if, if you could make fun of this, and that's the whole purpose of this movie. If you want to drive a man insane, just loop clips from these interviews. They're trying so hard, but not even Daniel Day-Lewis could act his way out of this situation. The desperation absolutely oozes from this movie, and it makes me squirm to think about. And this movie reminds me more of, like, Mel Brooks comedies. We can do funny things. We can do, like, oddly enough, never trying to be funny. We can have a, a version that we know will be okay for PG-13. We can have the version that might be too R-rated to be in the movie. Eitan has allowed me to push this to an even crazier place than I would ever expect. A characterization that she's come up with that's, you know, essentially mime. I mean, <laughs> what she's doing is inspired. Where he's like, oh, you can go further than that, and I already think that I'm being so crazy and weird. So we're really careful about making sure that we get all the different versions so that we don't shoot a a scene at the MPA then says, this can't be in the movie. And within the context of the scene and the writing, trust that it will turn out funny. And they are so good at playing misguided confidence. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> that's amazing! I think that's one of the things that Will does really well, is a confident idiot. So we're never going for jokes in, in a weird way. It's very important, yeah about Sherlock Holmes mm -hmm. is it, it's a musical. Now, because it's completely ridiculous, it, it works. So, uh, there, that's in the, another reason why to do this movie. Yeah. What's not to like? Don't use that. <laughs> God. We're really blowing it! In saying that though, it does hold a fair few accolades. It won the award for the worst poster ever conceived, and broke new ground in its six-time nomination at the Raspberry Awards, winning four of them. When you beat out Gotti and the Happy Time Murders, you know you fucked it. So it didn't make money, no one likes it, but is it really as bad as they say? The answer is yes, this is the worst Will Ferrell comedy. <laughs> with half of the movie being an incredibly basic Sherlock Holmes murder mystery, and the other half being the stepbrothers ad-libbing, and eating onions, Bad and just like an being man-children. You're left with this bizarre juxtaposition that makes every scene feel like a disjointed funny or die skit. Hello, Inspector Lestrade. That plays in a loosely connected sequence with an expensive Sherlock Holmes skin over it. There's a lot of talk about the unique way this pair acts out their scenes with a lot of on-the-spot ad-libbing. They improvise a lot, which is really fun to watch. Or Will and I will think of some stuff on our feet as we're going along. We become inspired by whatever we're doing. and It's a very get... relaxed atmosphere on set as well, which is helpful. Etan's just lovely and just lets you kind of play. Ad oh, silly question. Ad living. Ad living. Ad living. Ad living. So you're in the yeah, scenes, right. it's all in the page, yep. and you start to go. Well, this is a very imprecise science you're describing. Yeah. And that's the way we worked on Step Brothers, that's the way we worked on Talladega Nights, and it's really just... Will and I just trying to survive out there on camera. Follow, you know, a train of thought a certain Step way. Brothers and Talladega Nights, we had all kinds of room to kind of like just go nuts and just, but on this one, we there were certain marks we had to miss, mm -hmm. uh, had to hit. I was gonna say certain marks we had to miss. <laughs> uh, Their chemistry and talent as performers in the right circumstance can lead to some fairly funny comedy. 
The problem comes in when you have a directionless story with horrendous timing and complete lack of urgency. You can have all the money and talent you want, but if you do not have a solid vision for an idea as wacky as this, there's effectively no way to make it work. Absurd comedy is a treat when it's consistent with whatever story it is they're trying to tell. However, anyone would tell you that you cannot simultaneously be an off-the-wall absurdist comedy and a serious Sherlock Holmes murder mystery at the same time. They have a couple basic jokes that form the backbone of all the humour present in the movie. One of the major examples being that it's funny that people from the 1800s would not do or say things that someone in 2018 would. Like... Fake news. That's fake news. Or even board game jokes. Damn it! Just sunk my battleship! They very much enjoy a dash of raunch, but because this has to be a PG-13, it's mostly limited to the language that they use. A sniff of morning cocaine always helps the brain. Will Ferrell has long relied on his flowery vocabulary combined with his quick wit in order to shoot out wacky statements that catch you off guard. This can be funny when reeled back or controlled, or framed within a character that is memorable or likeable in some way, but here the ad-libbing is so obnoxious and lacking in any structure or subtlety that it makes scenes drag and feel completely disconnected. I cannot believe I'm saying this because I can't stand Step Brothers, but at least in that movie the style of humour is consistent with itself. It is quite literally the man-child movie, and if you find that concept funny, then I suppose it is succeeding at its job. However, deciding to, surprise surprise, make Sherlock Holmes into a man-child is so at odds with the intent of the character. There's nothing funny about this framing. Will Ferrell as Sherlock Holmes is not a genius move. Sailing under an alias. <sighs> the problem they found themselves with is that Sherlock Holmes is already so extreme and quirky in his behaviours as a character that they're almost trying to caricature a caricature. The original dynamic of Holmes and Watson works because one is the straight man and the other is a socially inept genius. Both of them being stupid man-children is not an inherently interesting dynamic, and a huge portion of the inherent situational comedy is left at the door. <coughs> the lack of creativity manifests with gags on the level as this. <coughs> Bad is like an apple, eh? Mm -hmm. The joke is Sherlock eating a raw onion because it will help him produce red blood cells. Can you increase your red blood cells? Then Holmes and Watson proceed to eat a raw onion, like over-the-top man-children who are playing it up for the camera. It feels more like they placed a pile of onions in front of Will Ferrell and John C. Riley and went, Go on then. Be funny. Instead of writing an actual parody of a Sherlock Holmes story that mocks the tropes and beats you'd expect. At points, it almost feels like it's going for something similar to Horrible Histories, which is an educational British show based on a series of books, where a group of comedians use absurd facts from the past as a means to teach kids about history. The difference, though, is that it's a small-scale TV show designed and marketed for children. Indeed, it is funny that what are now considered hard drugs in modern times were freely available for the public to consume, but that observation alone is not enough to inspire an entire movie's worth of jokes. An hour in and you get a scene where the stepbrothers take coke and start screaming and throwing a ball around. I could use a bit of cocaine. <laughs> That's the joke. You could take this entire scene out and nothing would change. The same could be said about the running gag with Queen Victoria, where John C. Riley thinks she's very attractive. Because you see, the joke is that Queen Victoria is known for being ugly. Maybe in the writer's room these ideas seem funny, as disparate throwaway jokes, but the way it comes together in the movie is unbearable. Oh, and thank you for your many years. There's a five hour long sequence where the stepbrothers appear to accidentally kill the queen, so they try to move her corpse in a box to hide the evidence, but she won't fit. Then she wakes up and the movie continues with something else. It means nothing and has no point aside from a failed gag. If the actual story of the movie was the stepbrothers trying to cover up the accidental murder of the queen, at least that's a silly comedic idea that could be a funny story. The reliance on random minion humour is shocking considering the release date. Balloons are happy, but they're not alive. Live. You could probably convince someone that this movie was in fact made in 2008, if not for the tired presidential commentary that isn't as clever as it thinks it is. We gave you your freedom and now look what you've done with it. Another outdated decision were the multiple jokes designed around directly parodying the Guy Ritchie Sherlock Holmes movies and the BBC show. The most obvious jokes you would think of when watching those movies are all in here. It's a recycled, tired punchline thrown out when Sherlock uses his brilliance to perfectly figure out how to swing a cricket bat to squash a mosquito, and later on they parody the fight scene from the 2009 movie, where the joke is that he's actually an idiot so his quick thinking doesn't work. 
God, that's brilliant. And if all of that wasn't enough, the technical shoddiness is a sight to behold. Multiple shots are out of focus, or the focus point is in a confusing or nonsensical position, and that's the lowest bar to me. Is the subject in focus? This is clearly not a stylistic or intentional decision, and indicates the quality level they were happy to settle for. Another embarrassing technical feature is the ADR and general coverage of dialogue. There are far too many noticeable moments where the audio doesn't match the performance. Master's brand of ink, which means you went into his desk. The dust in our boots is freshly dried clay. I never even heard anyone knocking. And heard anyone knocking. You're fighting my mate. Meet the hand of his loyal partner, Dr. Watson. You're staying, Dr. Watson, but I'll be on my way to America. I suppose this is a question of if this comes from laziness or ineptitude, and I'm inclined to think the former. The director of photography is not inexperienced by any means, so how else could the end result be this shoddy if not for a complete lack of creative investment? Besides, how is anyone supposed to plan out a great scene when so much of the humour comes from random improv from the lead actors? They designed the movie to be bad and didn't even realise it until it was far too late. So many scenes wind up with two to four characters awkwardly standing around with lacklustre energy and clear lack of direction. It's like nails on a chalkboard. Yes, I'm quite fine, my lover John Watt! I find it twice as frustrating that they had two British actors in the movie who I guarantee would have been a better Holmes and Watson, but they weren't in Step Brothers or Borat, so I guess the best casting in the entire project can stay as background uncredited scenery. Whatever. For what is supposed to be a comedy, I am dumbfounded by how easy it is to not laugh a single time. It is genuinely effortlessly humourless, and not in a way that makes it entertaining. This is not an enjoyably bad movie by any means. In fact, in many ways, this is an example of the absolute worst possible outcome for a big budget Hollywood production. I will always find a failure of this magnitude, especially considering the talent and influence involved, to be much worse than any small scale independent production ever could. It represents the inverse of everything that is good about cinema. It saps creativity. It makes the concept of comedy a distant pastime. I will say that John C. Riley's performance is not nearly as bad as Will Ferrell's. Prepare yourself to be astonished. You can tell he's overall a better performer and takes every role seriously, even if it's in something as bad as this. But as a British person, hearing them attempt an English accent adds yet another layer of misery to the experience. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's great that the cast and press had a great laugh making this movie. I gotta go. <laughs> so we just Must be a dream come true to be so famous that you can breeze through a project as bad as this, get paid hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars, and laugh about how little thought was put into the premise of the movie. This was new territory for me. <laughs> I was like, we let's do something fresh. <laughs> yeah. And I knew the kids are gonna love. Yeah. <laughs> right? And here we are. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to stop trying to make actual points about the movie and just, <laughs> just go with the convo, I think. <clears throat> so where does this movie belong in my ranking? Personally, this is not even close to being the worst comedy I've talked about in this series, despite it probably being the worst film I've ever seen with Will Ferrell as the lead. Not Cool, F the Prom, and Disaster Movie are all significantly worse, which leads me to ranking it as the 55th worst. If this movie inspires me to do anything, it's to formally apologise to Sherlock Gnomes. Comparatively, that movie is miles better in terms of adapting a Sherlock story. That's just how low the bar is now. Thanks for watching everyone, don't forget to check out the trying to watch for this movie, which should be up soon unless it gets taken down instantly, I don't know. Or even check out the entire search for the worst playlist for more videos. I've also opened up a P.O. box for if any of you have any obscure DVDs you think would make for a good video. The address is in the description. Bye!